Hello, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the Natural History Museum and welcome to Nature Live. My name is Camilla and I'll be your host for this afternoon's event. So pop up your hand if you've never been to one of our talks like this before. Brand new experience, great, <laughs> encouraging. Brand new experience for you, okay, good. So I'll give you a brief overview as to what we're about. So we run Nature Live talks to give all of you the chance to see some behind the scenes stuff here at the museum. So we've got about 80 million different specimens here and that includes our bats, our fossils, our uh, plant collection, birds, fish, mammals, dinosaurs, of course, pretty much everything you can think of involving the natural world. As you can imagine, we don't have the room to put everything out on display for you. The vast majority of our collections remains tucked away in spaces behind the scenes. But when you come to these talks, as you can see, we try and dig out some specimens so you can see them up close and in plenty of detail. We also usually give you the chance to speak to one of our museum scientists. We've got about between 300 and 350 scientific staff here at the museum. They're going out on field work, expanding the collections. There are curators looking after all the specimens. It's a lot to look after. So uh, Nature Live is your chance to speak to them face to face. We, it's slightly different today because Tom isn't based at the museum here. He's based at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. But he's very much a bat expert, so the next half hour is still your chance to ask him any questions you have about bats or his research or field work or anything like that. So please don't be shy. Tom, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. So tell us a bit about yourself. How did you first become interested in bats and what is it that you do now? So I think I was one of those kids growing up who always asked why perpetually to my parents. Um, and that led, I think, to a natural love of science, uh, asking why the natural world is the way that we see it. Um, so I studied a degree at, at Durham, doing studying ecology, and uh, I took the first opportunity that arose to actually go out and apply that. So I did a year in industry working for, uh, for DEFRA, studying bats. Uh, so that's when I first came across them, and they really, they're just absolutely fascinating. For someone who's, who's curious about how things are the way they are, bats are just fantastic, because there are so many little things about them that are so unusual and have evolved in strange and wonderful ways. Um, so then once I finished my degree, I then decided I'd spend four years studying bats for my PhD. And so a lot of, well, hands up, who, who here is a bit scared of bats? You find them a bit creepy, you're not so keen. Yeah. So that does seem to be quite, uh, quite uh, a thing. Wha why do you think that is? Why are people scared well of them? I mean, it's partly because they're mysterious, so they come out at night time. Um, you don't see them much during the day. And we're generally sort of fearful of things we don't know much about. Um, but in different cultures, they're, they're viewed in different ways. I mean, I in Europe, they're often sort of mysterious. They go in witches' cauldrons and that sort of thing. And some people think that might be because they're attracted to fires. So when you build, like, fires at night, bats often come in, and so they have that sort of mystery. But in other parts of the world, they have sort of positive connotations. So there's Inca gods that were uh, bats, and in China, there's symbols which are for good fortune, which are made up of bats. So it's, it's mainly in Europe that they have this sort of witchy dark mythology sort of feel. But actually, bats, bats perform a lot of what we call ecosystem services, don't they? How, how do they, not that we should only be interested in things that can provide <laughs> services for us, but they do do a lot of useful things for us, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. So one of, the, one of the most important things that bats do in terms of humans is they control agricultural pests. Um, so there's been some studies done in the States looking at how much they save us uh, in terms of money. So the idea being that if you got rid of bats, how much would you have to spend on pesticides and things to control, control insects? And they reckon it's about $5 billion annually um, in, in America. So they do provide some serious services. They also pollinate um, a lot of stuff as well. So some bats feed in pollen and nectar, and they'll carry pollen from one plant to another. So uh, if you like tequila, uh, that's a plant that's pollinated by bats, um, as are other things like mangoes and apricots and things. God bless bats. I know, absolutely. <laughs> so we did say we've got a couple of specimens to show you, and there's one under the visualizer at the moment, which is a skeleton of a bat. So um, they've got really interesting skeletons, haven't they? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so um, it says on the side of this box, Chiroptera, and that's because the Latin name for bats is Chiroptera. And uh, Cairo, the Cairo part of Chiroptera, comes in comes the same as uh, a chiropractor, someone who works with their hands. So Cairo means hand. And Patera is the same as pterodactyle, and that Terra there means wing. So Chiroptera means hand wing. So when you look at the skeleton here, the wing is made up of uh, the same bones as are in my arm. So if I, sort of, if I hold my arm like this, and you imagine my fingers are sort of five feet long, then that's the same structure you're seeing there. So it's still got this sort of, it's got the top of its arm, the elbow at the bottom there, and up to the wrist. Uh, you can see it's probably just on the edge, there's a tiny little thumb that comes off at the top, and then all its other fingers go down. And then the wing membrane 
would be connected between all of those, forming that big skin that then uses us to, to flap and fly through the air. So we can really see those interesting evolutionary similarities. Absolutely, yeah. And also, evolution drives this, this wing to heal as fast as possible. You can imagine if you were a bat and you flew into a spiky hedge and tore your wing. Um, that's really serious for you because you need to fly to be able to catch your, your prey and eat. So evolution has driven the wing membranes of bats to heal incredibly quickly. It's the fastest healing tissue in the mammalian kingdom is the bat's wing membrane. That's fascinating. Yeah. So there's one more specimen just behind that box. I wonder if we can push that across. So what kind of bat is this? So this is a, a greater horseshoe bat. So this is a, a bat species we find in the UK. Um, it's quite rare, uh, mainly down in the southwest. These guys do that classic sort of hanging upside down, wrapping their wings around, e around themselves, just like the classic bat look, uh, which is actually not that common. Bats don't typically do that. They normally roost the right way up, just holding onto a, uh, a bit of rock. But these guys will hang upside down and do that lovely sort of Count Dracula wrap around. Uh, they also have a, uh, a nose leaf, so on their face. In fact, if you can go back to that very first, the actual opening talk uh, title slide, I don't know if we can get that up. So this guy here, he has a nose leaf as well. This is really extended. So this is a spear-nosed bat. And this, this structure on its nose is much less pronounced in, in this guy. But it helps them to direct their echolocation calls. So they actually echolocate out of their nose. Um, most UK bats actually echolocate out of their mouth. But by echolocating out of their nose, it means they can have something in their mouth and still see where they're going at the same time, which is pretty clever. And we've got one final one on the table in front mm. of us, so we'll try and get that up on the screens for you guys. This one looks significantly bigger. Is this um, one of the more larger species? Yeah, in the I mean, this really highlights the diversity of bats. There's uh, over 1,200 species of bats, and they are incredibly diverse. So this is a, a fruit bat. Um, we don't get any fruit bats in the UK. They're found in uh, the tropics. Um, uh, a lot of them come in sort of Indonesia and, and Australia. Uh, and they'll fly around dawn and dusk and eating fruit. So they don't use echolocation, so he hasn't got anything fancy on his nose, um, but he's got quite big eyes. They've been filled in here with, with cotton wool because they don't preserve very well. Um, but it's got big eyes, which allows him to see in, in quite low light conditions. And big feet, you can see they're huge, huge claws here for hanging onto trees and stuff. And they'll just hang, they'll grab fruit, and they'll stuff their faces full. Uh, and uh, occasionally when you catch these sort of bats, um, when they're in flight, they've got fruit seeds and fruit juice just sort of smothered all over their face. They're not particularly... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, good well eaters. They, they gorge themselves, really. Yeah, they so go for it. <laughs> so it, it's not true at all, then. Um, sometimes you hear the kind of, is it a myth that bats are blind? And obviously, yeah. they've got very good hearing, Yeah, but they're not completely blind, then. No, not at all. So these, these bats, um, the fruit bats, they use sight as their primary mechanism for, for moving around. Um, these guys, the UK bats, um, they all use echolocation, so their sight is a lot more diminished. But they still use sight quite a lot. So when they're in their roosts and they're you know, crawling around, they'll be using sight. So they can see. So it's, yeah, it's a myth that uh, bats are blind. And we're going to be looking uh, a bit more about the echolocation stuff in a few minutes. But um, you have done a lot <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the past few years with regards to bats. Um, and you did some really interesting work for your PhD in Oxfordshire. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so my study was uh, in Whiteham Wood. This is a picture of my favourite tree in Whiteham Wood on the left. It's a huge tree in this clearing. Uh, Whiteham's a sort of four kilometre square wood just outside Oxford. It's, it's owned by the university and they use it for doing research. And they've got some of the longest experiments in the world have been running here. Uh, and one of them it looks at birds, and they've got all these uh, blue tit and great tit boxes all spread around the woods, over 1,600 of these bird boxes. So you can barely walk f you know, a minute without seeing a bird box. Um, but the guys there aren't interested in the bats, which move into the bird boxes once all the chicks have fledged, uh, which is criminal. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I started my PhD in, in collaborating with others as well, um, looked at, uh, at the bats that were using the boxes. This is a picture of one of the bats returning to the boxes. Uh, but what we'd do is we'd go around, we'd open up the, uh, the door, and if there were bats inside, they'll sort of uh, uh, aggregate up in the, in the top of the, uh, the box. And we've got, yeah, we've got a picture of that. This is a particularly full box. Um, so the space that they're occupying is that mass of bats is probably about this big, but there's probably about 35 to 40 bats in there. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can see, 
there's a slight difference in colouring. The bats at the bottom are slightly ginger and the ones at the top are slightly grey. I don't know if you can see that. But the adults get this sort of oranging of the fur over time. So you can tell they're adults. And be so, um, so we'd go and we'd, we'd collect all these bats out of the box and we'd weigh them and measure them, see how, how healthy they were, count their parasites, that sort of thing. And then we'd put rings on them. And you can see uh, a couple of uh, little silver rings. There's one right there. That's it. There's one just there. And these sit on their, on their arm. Uh, they don't cause them any, any hassle. Uh, and it has a little number on them. So it means that we know exactly which bat is which. So when we come back next time, we know who they are. So were you, were you mainly interested in um, how social they were, how, how much they liked being in groups? Or yeah, so that was one of, the, one of the main components of my PhD, was looking at their sociality. I looked at a couple of other things, like their, their habitat preference and, and their parasite stuff, which, which we'll come on to in a minute. But the, the, the coolest bit, I think, was the, the social stuff. So what we did was we looked at the individual bats that we saw over time and looked at which individuals were roosting with which other individuals. So did one bat have a preference for being around a certain group of friends? Um, we weren't really sure what we were going to find out. We know the bats are social, so they form these, these clusters, these little colonies of bats. But we don't know whether they really care who they're with. Is it just they just want to huddle because it's warm? Or do they actually want to be with specific individuals? And so we did this big analysis and we uh, created some uh, network uh, diagrams. It's going to need a little bit of explanation yeah. on this one. J don't be too overwhelmed. <laughs> okay, so every dot in this is a bat, okay? And lines connect that bat to every other bat it roosted with. Now, when I joined Facebook, you could create these things. I'm not sure they're still on there. So what you can see, if you look at the top left one, you can see really clear social groups, right? There's groups of bats who just hang out with each other, and I've given them different colours. And this was amazing. This is literally one of those eureka moments where I've been out in the field for three years collecting this data, and you put it into the computer, and you, you press the button, and you, you hope to God you're going to get something good out that you can write a thesis <laughs> about. And I got that, and I just, just I thought, that's absolutely brilliant. So that's one species, and then top right was the next species. And I'm just glad I didn't do that next species first, because I would have been really disappointed. That the social structure is like really hard to see. Uh, and so initially I was quite disappointed and, and also quite confused because we knew that that species was quite social. But then I split out the results to males and females. That's on the bottom. So it's that top right one just split out males and females. And what you see is the females have these really nice social groups, but the males don't. So the males are a bit promiscuous. They sort of move between these uh, the female groups, uh, but the females tend to keep themselves themselves. One thing that sticks out to me here is I feel a bit sa sorry for this little loner here. Yeah. Just sort of stuck out there. Yeah. It, it could have well been one guy who just sort of came through in passing and sort of hung out with them for a day and then, and then flitted off and went somewhere else. So how long did all this work take, this work in the woods? So I did three field seasons, so three summers going out in the wood, uh, because we were only looking at the bats in the summer. So in winter, bats go and hibernate, so they'll go and find places which are cold and humid, so caves or old cellars and that sort of thing. So we were just looking at them in the summer. So it was three summers, and then there was another year on the end as well for me to write up and do all the analysis and that sort of thing. Fun part. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd say that. <laughs> so you also mentioned you were looking at some of the parasites on the bats. Now, is it quite common for bats to, to have parasites? Yeah. So, so any animal that's, uh, especially mammals, any mammals that are quite gregarious, that hang out in groups in close contact, uh, tend to get lots of parasites. I mean, that's why kids get nits, right? Because they're all in close contact at school. Um, so same with bats. They, they get quite a lot of parasites. Um, we also found quite a bit of variation, so the amount of parasites bats get depends on how healthy the bat is. So if the bat's really unhealthy, it tends to get more parasites, probably because it's, it's worse at grooming itself. Um, and also in the peak in the summer, um, right in the middle of the summer, when all the bats are breeding and there's loads of young, yummy, can't groom themselves very well bats, the parasites reproduce like mad to infest all these, all these juveniles. So, so does it... Um you came across different kinds of parasites. Yeah, so do they affect the bats in different ways? Yeah, so, so that last one was a, was a bat fly, which is, which is a, uh, a fly, it's a diptera, but it's evolved to have no wings, and it spends its entire life just living on bats, crawling around. Um, and this is a, a tick. This is called a long-legged bat tick, not that imaginatively named. Um, you can see there, right on the front of that grey mass is a little circular dark shield. Um, when the tick hasn't been feeding, that's its size. It's just that little dark bit on the front. And then when it latches on to a bat, it just swirls up this sack and just fills up. But its legs also get about 10 times as long, so these are really long. Um, and that, that uh, yeah, oh, brilliant, yeah. So this is him, it's that same tick, attached to the neck 
of a uh, greater horseshoe bat. That's, that's this, that same bat that we had down here that we looked at a minute ago. Um, so I, I think he quite appreciated having that removed from his neck. <laughs> so you were looking at um, the presence of viruses as yeah. well. Why, why were you doing that? So one of the things we were interested in was how the social structure affects, is affects the, the diseases that bats have. And parasites are a, a really easy thing to study because you can just hold up a bat and you can count how many flies and ticks and mites and stuff it's got on it. Um, but really, viruses are a bit more interesting because quite a lot of viruses that humans have have ancestors in bats. And so understanding a bit about these viruses would be, would be quite useful. So we would collect uh, samples of poo from the bats and then we'd go to the lab and we'd smush up this poo into uh, a special liquid which would help to extract all the DNA from it. And then we use these special molecules which basically hunt for the DNA of the viruses we're interested in. And these, these molecules, they find all this DNA. And then we, once we've collected all the uh, virus and molecules that we're interested in, we can then put them through a sequencing machine. And this translates the DNA into the letters that make it up, A's and T's and C's and G's. And you end up with like hundreds of these letters all in lines. And then we can do big searches online against massive databases of DNA data and try and figure out how our virus fits into the massive family tree of viruses that are out there. Fascinating stuff. And yeah. um, would anyone like to ask Tom any questions about bats or his work at this point in time? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, when they go to hibernate, they often travel quite a long way to a hibernation site. Um, but they uh, usually will return. We think there's some variation between males and females. Um, and there's a bit of difference between species, but the, the two I was looking at, it looked like the females were more prone to return and the males more prone to move somewhere else. Um, and that could be an evolutionary response to inbreeding. So obviously if, if the same bats came back in those same social groups year on year on year, you'd get quite a lot of inbreeding. So it might well be that the males are dispersing and that's part of the reason why it would be to, to promote outbreeding. Good question, thank you. Was there another one at the back? Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's almost certain that pesticides will have an impact on bats because they're, they're killing off their prey. Um, it's hard to tell, though, because we don't have good bat records going back to pre-pesticides. Um, so almost certainly uh, there's been a, a big negative effect in history, but, but it's hard to quantify. Um, we do know that there was some timber treatment used um, uh, you know, 50 years ago which would um, prevent, I'm not going to know what it is, but there's some, something that burrows in your, in your beans in your attic, which you don't want. And you can treat your timber to, to stop that. Uh, and that was killing bats that were roosting on those, on those beans. So that's not used anymore. They use different, di different things. But yeah, pesticides are definitely a concern. Um, and also a big one for bats is uh, uh, habitat destruction. So bats um, require uh, places to roost. These are typically sort of big old trees with sort of limbs falling off, which have got lovely nooks and crannies for them to go into. And these aren't the sort of trees that we keep in the landscape because they're health and safety hazard or whatever. It would be more productive to, to grow three new trees or whatever. Um, and that's why all British bat species are protected by law, uh, because they just don't have many places to roost anymore. And if we were to all to kick them out of our houses, then that would be really bad for them. Good question. Thank you very much. So Tom, something else that you're very interested in is the role that technology might be able to mm. play in terms of people getting a bit more interested in the science in terms of studying bats. So firstly, you have brought along one of your bat detectors. Yeah. Can you just explain to us how it works? Because we know that echolocation is really important in terms of their calling. Can we, s can we hear some bat calls, but not all of them? So the kids in the audience can probably hear some bats calls. The, the uh, elder people may not. Um, they're very, very high in the audible spectrum. Um, when bats make social calls, which is when they're talking to one another, or feeding buzzes, which I'll come on to in a minute, they particularly are low frequency, so you might hear them. Uh, I can just about hear them, and, and I try and describe it as it, it's so high-pitched that sort of you sort of hear it right in the back of your head, really, really high-pitched screeching noise. But they use this echolocation to see in complete darkness. So you can imagine if you were in a pitch-black room and someone f uh, used a camera flash, for that, for that microsecond you'd be able to see the entire room. And that's what it's like for a bat when it sends out an echolocation call. So it can see the entire room just for a split second. Uh, and so then when it's echolocating, it's actually sending out these pulses uh, quite frequently. So it's jump, 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 as it's flying. So it can get to see sort of snapshots of the world around it. And then as it comes up to, if it sees like a fly or an insect that it wants to eat, so all UK bats eat insects. 
it'll speed up this, uh, this, this, these echolocation pulses. So you can imagine that strobe light sort of flicking faster and faster, so you can see much better how things are moving. And then right as it's coming in and it's about to catch the prey, it, it goes so fast, it sounds like a sort of, <laughs> sort of, sort of raspberry noise. And it's all these echolocation pulses like really close to one another. So it can see in like super high resolution. Um, it doesn't do it all the time because when it goes faster, it has to be quieter, so it can't see as far. Yeah. So actually now might be a good opportunity to listen to some uh, back calls that you've recorded. Mm. So have these been treated at all to make them audible for us? So these are um, the sort of calls you'd hear on a, on a, detector, li a detector like this. Yeah. So I think we've got a, a, a Pipistrel, I think is the first one. And it's um, recorded on a heterodyne back detector like this. Um, and these allow you to sort of tune in to, uh, to the frequencies that bats listen to. And it, I don't know if you can hear it. it sort of, so rubbing your fingers together makes quite a lot of ultrasound. Um, and so do electronics. Like, well, you can hear it. Like, <laughs> like my phone behind this table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's listen to some back clips, and you should be able to hear the distinctive features between the three different species. So that's a pipistrel. I always think it sounds a bit, it's quite bubbly. Particularly in this middle bit here. It sort of sounds a little bit like sort of bubbles in thick mud, or something like that. So pipistrels are really common. They're the most common bat uh, in the UK. If you see things flying around outside your house, that's probably what you, you've seen. They're also very small. So this is a Dorbenton's bat. There's actually a whole group of bats, myotis, that all sound almost identical to this. Very dry. They're rustly. And this is a noctual. There's two or three bats that sound like this. This is sort of the jazz beat bat. So it's going um, So these are big bats, these ones. About the same size as this greater horseshoe. And uh, they're very, very loud. So that could have been recorded easily from 30, 40 meters away, whereas the pit would have been sort of within about 10 meters. And they're also very low frequency. So uh, the kids might be able to hear those as well. So actually, in, in the dark, th th these calls are very sort of um, species specific. So if you can recognize the call, you kind of know what you've got around you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you take one of these detectors out uh, and you can sort of buy CDs which have bat calls and stuff on, you can sort of tune into them. And those, those are sort of the three groups. There's a, there's a few bats that sound a bit like those, but with just sort of five, 10 minutes, you can sort of figure out, you, you, can, you can teach yourself how to identify those sort of three rough groups. Yeah. So you've devised something really cool, which is uh, the idea is to plug a bat detector into an iPad or a tablet or your yeah. smartphone even, so you can visualize the calls. Why, yeah. why is it useful to do that firstly, to see S the calls? Yeah, so, so like I said, some of the um, some of the bats are quite similar. So for example, the noctual, there's another bat called a serotine, which sounds quite similar in the field. So if you wanted to know for sure what it was, you'd have to go home and, uh, and get the recording up. So here we've got a, a picture of what happens if you put them on a graph, basically. So just those sounds you were hearing put on a graph, um, horseshoe bats, like this, this one that I had on here a minute ago, they're the ones in the top left. They sort of go, a little bit kind of spooky. Um, Dorbentons, they're these big downstroke ones here on the next, the next three. And then we've got two uh, there. One looks a little bit like a hockey stick, the first one, that one there. Uh, that's the pipistrel, having this sort of little kink at the bottom. And then at the end here, we've got the sort of noctuals, the sort of lower ones. But really, you need to do this if you're going to be able to say, right, I'm sure this is a nocturnal bat. So my, my frustration was that with this, I can hear them. Um, and I've got another bat detector over here, which is essentially the same. Um, but that you can't see it in the field. So I went out and bought some cables um, to plug my iPad into my bat detector. And this allows you to be able to visualize uh, bat calls um, out in the field. Let me see, I should be able to turn this on. Right, so let me get that straight for you. So right now, is that picking up any surround? Can you hear him pick up my voice, say, when I'm speaking? So if I point at you, there's not really much going on because your voice isn't ultrasonic, unfortunately. Um, rubbing my fingers together is ultrasonic, so you can see that like that. And has anyone got some keys in the audience? Or, or like a handful of, of change that you can rattle around? <laughs> Something up the back there? Give him a rattle. Oh, wow, look at that! <laughs> so jangling keys, metal on metal, makes really low, really, really loud ultrasound. Very, very loud. Probably much louder than, uh, than a bat would be. 
Um, so it's kind of a fascinating new world that you're introduced to when you start taking your bat detector out. All sorts of things make ultrasonic noise. You also get some crickets and grasshoppers and things which are ultrasonic. Electric fences. I spent ages once, stood in the fence, and like, there's a clicking noise every 10 seconds, and I cannot figure out what it is. And there was an electric fence right next to me. Well, in terms of using something like this out in the field um, for scientists, is that problematic to have other, um, other things come up on the readings? Is it still going to yeah, be... Yeah, you can generally, f you generally sort of you learn what these sorts of things are. So, so this is quite handy because it, it, it's handy because it's, it's nice, isn't it, just to look at it as well. It's kind of fun to see it. Um, it means you can do some sort of ID in the field. And there are systems like this, which you can just plug straight into an iPad, but they're hundreds of pounds. Whereas I already have this bat detector, and these cables cost me, you know, twenty quid from a map lens or something. So, um, yeah, it's kind of nice, fun way uh, to sort of be able to visualise stuff in the field. Excellent stuff. And there's there's we've got a few minutes left, and I just want you to talk about the one other thing that you've been uh -huh. working on, which is kind of like a bat detector drone type thing. <laughs> we've got a video clip of you uh, setting it in action. So let's play that for you guys now. So describe to us what we're looking at here. So this is a, a, rem a standard remote control plane. Um, I'm holding it there. And uh, this is we. The aim is to to uh, attach a bat detector to the wing of this plane. Um, this is the the brainchild of uh, mine and a, and a university friend of mine. We came up with it at a, at a wedding after a couple of beers. Uh, we thought, well, he loves remote control planes. So I was like, why don't we connect our? Uh, this isn't meant to happen. <laughs> just in case you're wondering, uh, <laughs> why don't we connect a bat detector to a plane? So we've we've been working on this for a few months, and uh, it's showing real promise. Wha what's quite cool about yeah, that's. <laughs> You don't want that to happen to your plane. That's the fuselage snapped in half. But what's clever about this is, you know, f for a couple of hundred pounds, you can buy these hobby remote control planes, which can just do the most amazing things. So it's got telemetry systems and GPS inside. You'll see now, I sort of threw it like a big paper airplane. There was no one controlling the plane there. All that happened was the telemetry unit said, oh, I've been thrown because I accelerated incredibly quickly. Time to get flying. The engine switches on, and then it just heads off to its first GPS waypoint and you can just sort of get them to fly around. So these really have huge potential, for, for not just for detecting bats, but for all sorts of things. They can fly into hazardous areas. They can cover real big distances. Um, so for bats, for example, you could use them, you know, you know, searching bats along cliffs or wherever it's dangerous to go, or at height. So when people install wind turbines, they want to know if there's bats flying around, so you can use them flying around at height. Um, people have used them for uh, searching for poachers in Africa. So they uh, use these sort of planes with cameras on, patrol up and down along fence lines and things. Uh, they've used them to look at for orangutan nests. So orangutan create nests, which I thought was bizarre in and of itself, up in uh, treetops. And they're quite hard to see on the ground, plus you've got to traipse all the forest. So they were flying these drones, just over uh, drones over the top, and you could take pictures and then you could just see where all the nests were clear as day. And I guess the cool thing is with technology nowadays and things like Google Maps, you can know the lay of the land before you... And then you, what I didn't realise is what I asked you before, which is if you're kind of controlling the plane, yeah. uh, what if it goes behind some forestry, you can't see where it is anymore, yeah, yeah. and then, yeah, you said to me, it's a pre-programmed doesn't matter, it's doing all route. itself, yeah, this is uh, just the, the telemetry data from the plane, because you can pull all that telemetry data back and plot it on Google Earth, and you can see we're just running, running loops of the plane here, and, and you've got all that amazing data, and they're very clever, I mean, if they like, run out of batteries, for example, they think they're about to run out of batteries, they'll just fly back to wherever they were launched from, and yeah, very, very smart, and they can carry a lot as well, so uh, we're seeing more and more of, of use of these sorts of technologies. Quite often, we, we're, we're piggybacking, scientists are piggybacking on something that's really great in the commercial sector. So remote control, plane, smartphones, for example. Smartphones are amazing. They're computers in your pocket with GPS and cameras and con internet connection, and everyone has them. So we now see more and more projects that are using these to gather data. So in my current work, we do a lot of work developing smartphone apps for uh, for citizens to go out, gen members of the public go out and record stuff. So we have things like a ladybird app and a butterfly app, which let you go out on a on a sort of walk on a Sunday afternoon. If you see a butterfly, you can take a picture and try and identify it using the guide, and then submit it. And then we can use those records to assess how these animals are doing over time, you know, and the impacts of climate change and habitat on UK wildlife. Well, you guys know what you're doing for the rest of the afternoon, Max. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are pretty much out of time, but I'm really keen to offer up if anyone's got any final questions. For oh, yeah, hand up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. So, so um, some bats, like fruit bats, will still use sight because they're flying quite early, so around dusk, to, to, to 
where the fruit is. They often also fly en masse, so there's some sort of you know, uh, uh, communication, I guess, following each other. Um, sometimes they will use smells if it's quite a fragrant fruit, but the coolest one is um, there's some plants which, because they need bats to pollinate them, it's in their interest to attract the bats to them, and they have these, these flowers that are sort of cone-shaped, and what scientists realized was that if you send an echolocation pulse at this flower, from pretty much any angle, it beams that pulse straight back at the source. So for a bat, or, or for us it would be like walking down the street and then having someone shining a flashlight at you from across the street, or like a high-vis jacket, it's that sort of glare. So when a bat's flying through the forest, these plants are sort of saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, come and pollinate me. And they reward the bats with, with nectar. Yeah. That was a great question. Thank you very much. So, guys, we are just about out of time. Before you disappear, I just want to promote the activities we've got going on in the museum for the rest of today as part of Bat Festival. So we've got lots and lots more specimens like like this fruit bat and um, the horseshoe bat was in it over there. Yep. Um, our curator of mammals is out in the galleries just by the cocoon with lots more specimens for you to see. So do go out and visit her. In the wildlife garden, you can make a bat box to take home with you. You can make insect hotels, learn all about um, UK habitat that are suitable for bats. So there's lots to see and do. It's all free, so do take advantage of that. Um, but for now, please do join me in thanking Tom for his time this afternoon. Thank you.